uh, let's welcome up our first person of the evening. Give it up for Matt. I'm in sixth grade. I'm wearing gym shorts because we have to run the mile in gym class and my school doesn't have a locker room. I'm also wearing a new pair of underwear and I don't realize it but it's a little too big for me. I'm in Mrs. Schultz's math class. I sit in the front of the room next to Mrs. Schultz because I'm not a well-behaved person. <laughs> I face my classmates while she's teaching and at one point I spread my legs a little too wide and my penis drops out of my underwear <laughs> and out of my gym shorts. And it remains there for what my friend Derek will later describe as a freaking long time. <laughs> I live in Blackstone, Massachusetts. It's a tiny little town, and it is really hard in a small place to overcome a reputation. <laughs> I have a hundred kids in my class of the same hundred I started kindergarten with. And when you do something really terrible, you can never put it behind you, especially flashing your math class <laughs> when your last name is Dix. <laughs> so. When I'm 16, I go to McDonald's to work in Milford, and within four days, there are two girls arguing over who's going to date me first. This does not happen to me. Girls do not argue over me. They ignore me. They actively ignore me. And I don't understand what's going on. And at first, I think the people in Milford, they're just like smart, and my hometown is an idiot. <laughs> But what I come to understand is the kids who go to work after school at McDonald's, they're a special breed of person. There are no jocks, because they're all at practice. There's no cheerleaders. There's no yearbook staff. Anyone who has any college aspiration is after school building a resume. There's also no like upper middle class kids there, because their parents don't let them work at McDonald's. You end up with the leftovers, and I am a leftover. But for some reason, I am the king of the leftovers. <laughs> And in within a month, I'm the most popular kid at McDonald's. From 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock, I am king. The only time, but I am king. And while I'm doing that, I meet Sherry. Sherry is the shyest person I've ever met. I work with her for four months, and I never hear her speak once. She is a silent person. And I see myself a little bit in Sherry, and so I reach out to her. I, I say hi. I say goodbye to her. If there's a joke going on, I fill her in on that joke. I just reach out to her a little bit. And then one day she comes to me and she pushes a piece of paper in my hand and runs away. And I open it and there's a question. It says, will you go to the prom with me? Now, I have a girlfriend. Her name is Lisa. She is also a leftover. And we, everyone knows that because I'm working together, Sherry knows I have a girlfriend. But I figure I'm going to take Sherry to the prom. It's the right thing to do. And so the next day, I push a piece of paper into her hand with the word yes. And so we go to the prom together, and we show up there, and as we're approaching our table, I see that I actually have a friend at her prom, her, his name's Pat, and he stands up and he says hello, and he says, who are you here with? And I say, I'm with Sherry. She's standing right next to me. And he says to me, who's Sherry? <laughs> He goes to Hopedale, Massachusetts school. There's 60 kids in his class, and he doesn't know who Sherry is. And so we sit down at the table, and I know Sherry is uncomfortable. She is shrinking in her seat. She's getting smaller and smaller. She does not want to be there. And so after 10 minutes, I lean over and say, do you want to leave? And she says, yes. It's the fastest yes I've ever heard. And so we leave, and we go to the Milford Theater to the movies in our tuxedo and gown. We see Beetlejuice, and we eat popcorn, and it's great for Sherry because she doesn't have to talk, but she can be normal like everybody else. And then we go to the Dairy Queen, and I want her to get out so they can see us in our, in our formal wear, and she doesn't want to, but I convince her to, and we sit on a picnic table, and we eat chocolate ice cream, and she spills some on her pink dress, and she laughs, and it's the only time she laughs that night. And then I bring her home, and I kiss her on the cheek at the stoop, and I say goodnight, and I leave feeling like I've done something really good. 
And then three days later, she comes into McDonald's and I can see that she's mad. And this is a problem because Sherry is nothing. She is not happy, she's not sad, she is flat. And she is now mad and she's walking towards me and she's talking and she's talking loudly. And she is asking me why I haven't called in the last three days and why I'm still with Lisa and why we're not together. And I realize like we have a misunderstanding here. And I try to explain to her that like this is not what you think it was and we just went to the prom and she's getting louder and louder and Sherry does not get loud and people are looking at us and I'm getting embarrassed and I'm like, Sherry, I just did you a favor. And I know when I say that how awful it is. But I also know it's not true. I wasn't doing Sherry a favor. I was doing myself a favor. There are people who give money anonymously because they don't want credit. And then there are people who give money because they want their name on a building. I wanted my name on a building. I wanted everyone in McDonald's to know that I took this girl to the prom and what a good guy I was. And this is not what I imagined it to be. And then she pushes another piece of paper in my hand and leaves to the back of the restaurant and I open it and it is this angry screed complaining about why I'm with Lisa and why I did this and why I did that. And then I reach the sentence that says, if we can't be together, I'll kill myself. And I know Sherry is not going to kill herself. I know she's just angry and if I go back there, I could fix it. We could talk and things would be fine. But that does not fit my narrative. That is not why I got involved. So I bring that letter to Allison, my boss, and she goes into full corporate mode. She calls Sherry's parents, she calls the company, they have a meeting, and I never see Sherry again. She never comes back to work. It's, it's nice to be king. It is great to be king of the neglected and the rejects. But when I think about Sherry, I sometimes wonder if that sixth grade version of myself with his penis hanging out in front of class, I wonder if that version of myself wasn't a better version of myself. Thank you. Give it up for Matthew Dick!